okay greetings everyone good evening good evening sir and everyone present here uh thank you so much for joining for today's session for with savit we are so glad to have you all here today's session is about the upcoming trends in the indian auto industry and before starting with today's session i'd like you to introduce to our guest speaker mr nishant govind rajan he is an automobile engineer and an enthusiast currently working as a customs analyst at ford global business solutions in materials planning and logistics prior to this he has worked at an indo japanese automotive company in ecu calibration and testing he is passionate about anything auto and is skilled in product strategy and planning he is graduated from srm institute of science and technology and is a certified lean six sigma black belt and has done process excellence projects in supply chain production and finance at ashok leyland he is also an astc certified automotive technician level 5 and has devoted his life to the diy uh, ideology when it comes to training uh, maintaining his vehicles he is also a certified classification specialist he is currently pursuing his mtech in automotive electronics from bits pilani work integrated project learning systems and he loves playing with his uh, he loves playing tennis and critiquing vehicle portfolios on sale nishant sir is also management committee member of sa india southern section mahindra world city division and strives to bring about a positive change to the society it's so great to have you with us again sir Yeah, thanks a lot, Charul. It's really nice that uh, you all have invited me. It's really an honor to, uh, you know, be invited for the second time and interact with you all again. And uh, just wanted to say, SA VIT is doing really great in terms of uh, reach to the students, and you're delivering the correct content, correct automotive content. Nice to see that all of you are uh, automotive enthusiasts as well. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. It's always great to have you with us, sir. Thank you. so uh, we can start the session when uh, when everyone's ready yeah absolutely so i think everyone's ready we can start i'll okay. just start the recording sure so i'll share my screen we ready to go sir okay so good evening again everybody again once again so it's really an honor for me to you know be connected with you virtually to share my views on what the indian auto industry will face in the upcoming months and years and what products you can expect from the automakers in india so this would give you an overview of what the next 45 minutes would entail and then i would you know uh, it would like to interact with you for the for 15 20 minutes afterwards so we can have an overview of the indian auto industry at the beginning the current ideology as to how the products are designed and how the uh, end consumer would get your products and the future trends or rather upcoming trends few concepts which whose technologies will make it into reality and finally the q&a session so the you would be aware of the the auto industry if you had seen my previous lecture as well on the same topic uh, india sells a lot of two wheelers three wheelers four wheelers uh, commercial vehicles like trucks and buses and also a whole lot of uh, things so if you take a global perspective india is the fourth largest auto market in the whole world and we sell around 30 lakh cars annually this is last year's data that is post covid or rather in the far end of covid i would say so in the year on year we've grown 27% and obviously the segment leader would be maruti with 13 lakh say cars sold and quite close behind i mean with each other would be hyundai and tata so this is where we are in the global perspective we are in the fourth place we the previous time which we were here in the fourth place was in back in 2018 so it was a good jump a good recovery from uh, a slew of regulation changes with emissions safety 
and also the covid which hit a lot of sales and we had the first month on record where zero sales were you know placed which was april 2020 going on what exactly do we make we make a range we make a bit of everything and we make you know lots of most things as well so we make anything from cycles to two wheelers bikes scooters trucks trains three wheelers cars uh, ships tanks the whole lot so i would just like to, to give you a couple of insights on the newer features which are coming on you know little little bits of Cycles are always there. You have TI and Hero who are huge manufacturers of cycles, but then you also have other players who give you an added push, who give you the option of e-mobility starting from the cycle itself. And you have, say, a small motor put on to the rear wheel, or uh, which helps you to traverse uh, hills and gradients, even though it is a geared cycle. Uh, in two wheelers all the connected you know the connected car features are coming into the two wheelers as well with most of the launches recently focus on bluetooth connectivity turn by turn navigation and also anything which can you know take your mind off driving while you're driving and connect your cell phone to the to the two wheeler which is really dangerous in certain cases but you also have nifty things like royal enfield stripper navigation Trucks have, you know, uh, surpassed the level of uh, global trucks in the way wherein they emit little to nothing. They perform really well, and also they can carry more loads legally as the axle load norms have increased. And then it's really very difficult to keep up with them on the highway. Like for example, a couple of days back, I was traveling from my office to my home on a big on the big gst and it was really difficult you know keeping up with the bharat benz uh, 13 ton truck who was flying at 80 kmph and fully loaded the last time i've seen a truck fly was when the semi trucks drag race so that far uh, we've come in technological advancements with the advent of bs6 for trucks who have great performance gains who have uh, zero to little emissions, I would not say zero, we always have emissions. But compared to BS4, we have far fewer emissions with the trucks with the with their SCR systems and uh, DPFs and uh, LNTs, lean knock straps. Uh, three wheelers, as I always say, the electric vehicle space, electric vehicle arms of the three wheeler companies are really gaining traction to the point wherein uh, I would you would see in the upcoming slides wherein uh, a foreign company is investing their end of life EV batteries for three wheeler products for India. So the unorganized sector for e three wheelers is really ramping up, and the organized sector is also increasing with the advent of Mahindra's Trio, and uh, with the likes of Omega, Seiki Mobility, and so on, and also e Trio. Cars we've seen mostly you know all there is to see from the global stage to the indian market we have full-blown hybrids on sale with the toyota camry the prius prius was on sale briefly but has paved the way for the camry we have evs the mg zs uh, hyundai kona hyundai uh, kia ev6 also which was a real you know stunner for me i never thought they would introduce it in the indian market but lo and behold they have uh, you know more sooner than later we'll also figure out say the hydrogen fuel cell and filling stations and we'll end up having the mirai also in india for mainstream customers buses have become really safe and the whole uh, crash crash worthiness factor has really come up to buses they are no longer sold as you know just a roll away chassis or a cut away chassis you have fully built solutions in, in mostly all manufacturers now and for world's first you also have a monocoque platform in a bus like who would think you know we would just expect a ladder frame chassis and you know uh, you give it to your local bodybuilder you'll put a body on it but no you have fully built customized solutions and mainstream monocoque bodies on buses 
with the commercial vehicle industry and tractor industry had a slight blow with the introduction of TREM4 or CEV4 uh, emission norms, which is equivalent to, say, a Bharat Stage 4. But it, it's a really big deal when it comes to off-highway machinery, uh, which really don't have a higher operating range. They just have low loads and loads of torque to operate uh, their many multiple uh, attachments from their power takeoff. But that impact was only for say about 10% and that was only for above the 50% horsepower range of tractors and backhoe loaders or any construction equipment for that matter. Uh, the other picture in the lower bottom of the screen next to the tractor has been in the news for all the wrong reasons. Uh, there have been so many EV fires in the country and the sad part is when they're being transported to the dealer stockyard or the dealership Many dealerships have also caught fire and also there are certain issues. We agree that there are issues with you know, electric vehicles. You know, the government has also ordered a probe into why they catch fire. Like maybe this would force manufacturers to do more uh, end of line testing and real world testing for Indian conditions. So this is on the uh, OEM side, but we do have a lot more components which we do make. The IC engine as such is not dying. We have people figuring out ways to put different fuel into the uh, engine, like uh, engine. For example, uh, Porsche and the Volkswagen Group have come close to developing a synthetic fuel, which uh, can be put into their uh, GDI engines, which will give you close of the performance, close to the performance of the previous generation or you could say uh, E10 blended petrols or close to diesels as well. So the IC engine is not dead because you have the big logistics industry which depends on IC and uh, not 90 percentage of electrification or fully blown 100 percent EVs can cater to the needs of the trucking industry anywhere in the world. Coming to the axle front, you do have you know regular IC engine axles, but you also have E axles more often than not being developed by homegrown manufacturers, uh, for example Dana, Spicer, and a couple of more tier two, the tier one manufacturers. Obviously, this the right third image has been the you know topic of debate for a couple of years now. The semiconductor chip shortage is really reduced production volumes. And not only that, it has hit the words of many OEMs because they promised to give you, say, a 10-inch screen and active cruise control and all bells and whistles. But the, at the end of the day, you get a car maybe three, four years past when they promised that they'll deliver it to you and you won't even find a music system in it. And you will have to get it all by yourself, even though paying an arm and a leg for it. So traction motors that was made by AVL for the entire drive unit for the front or the rear axle depending upon the, the configuration. Brakes, there's a really interesting story on brakes in the concept slide which is coming up. The good thing about the batteries is that homegrown manufacturers like Amaron and Exide have tied up with global giants to manufacture lithium ion cells in India or assemble lithium ion you know, modules in India, which would really, you know, give us a sort of individuality and, uh, you know, less of lesser dependence on the Red Dragon. Obviously, you've seen ultra low rolling resistance tires for EVs, and you've also seen smart tires, which have the TPMS on their own and also detect the tread and the pressures and temperatures and, you know, really give you an idea of how you're driving and based on the pattern of your driving how you can drive better for better fuel efficiency and tire life right so if you had seen my lecture a couple of years back or even last year i would have said that the future it would be bs6 we've already come to bs6 and we've had so many vehicles running on bs6 be it petrol diesel cng you know lpg Everything is BS6 now. Now the worry is BS6 stage 2. So what is BS6 stage 2? 
you have a lot of monitoring which takes place for reliability and longevity. You have CATCON monitoring, you have uh, OBDs, onboard diagnostic systems, which are supposed to be mandatory even for bikes. And by the way, the two-wheeler industry in India has the most advanced emission, most stringent emission norms in the whole world. Not even Japan or Europe has the level of uh, strict emissions we do. And that's mostly down to the sheer number of two-wheelers we produce and sell you know, each year. So another thing which can affect the way the, the people design your products, say you would want say a V6 for your Mercedes, but then you will end up having a four cylinder because you don't meet your corporate average fuel economy target for the fuel efficiency as well as the carbon, carbon dioxide emissions. So the CAFE 2 norms play a really important role because it doesn't depend upon a, a sample of a car or a model which you sell, it depends upon the number of cars you sell. So just to take an example, Maruti, if they sell 13 lakh cars a year, all the 13 lakh cars put together, the average of their fuel efficiency should be under uh, should be over a particular limit and their CO2 emissions should be under a particular limit. So it depends really on the outliers which is the people who sell the least cars and the people who sell the most cars. So these two manufacturers have to really you know rack their brains together and figure out a way to meet these targets. One way would be mild hybrids or micro or uh, uh, medium hybrids which would just be a starter generator which would help out in giving you assistance like the shvs system of maruti's or a full-blown hybrid like the upcoming high rider or uh, the upcoming fortuner in novas which is posted to be launched in 2025 or so so that one thing which reports say is a diesel hybrid configuration which would help them to gain their corporate average fuel, efi fuel efficiency and CO2 targets. But then the final, well, I don't want to say nail in the coffin because I would like to say, uh, I would like to keep driving IC engines and you know make them last for a longer, longer period. But the final coup de grace would be the real driving emission tests. The real driving emissions really depend upon whether your vehicle performs as it should under the limits of hydrocarbons, carbon dioxide, uh, nitrogen oxide emissions at all levels of uh, you know driving. Like when you are in a test cycle, say the WLTP test cycle, a harmonized test cycle procedure, you would have curves or you would have um, waves which indicate a high gradient wherein your engine would be at four and a half five thousand rpm you would have uh, deceleration accelerations you would have wide open throttle you would have so many cases wherein it is forced to give out more knocks or the engine operating uh, temperatures would be so high that NOx production would be maximum and the engine is you know, forced to give out the max torque and max power. So at those places, it's easier or rather it is relatively easier to cheat. Like we, there have been many instances where manufacturers have been found guilty of tweaking their uh, ECMs or engine control modules to behave properly in their uh, WLTP test cycle procedure when they are tested by government agencies. But in the real world, it's not the case. You have had so many, you know, issues from say uh, Daimler, BMW, Audi, Volkswagen, and even Maruti in certain cases because Suzuki in certain cases because of the Fiat engines. So how do we beat this? There is one way. The car is supposed to be sold in a particular market. Let's say India. India has extreme temperature high temperatures in certain areas, low temperature in certain areas, it has altitude, it has uh, places that are on sea level, it has places where there is lots of rain, it has places where it's very parched, there's absolutely no water, you have hills, you have plains, you have, you have a combination of the two as well, you even have snow in most places. 
So what can you do? You can attach a portable emission testing device to the back of the car. As the car drives along, the exhaust gases filter into this sort of contraption which is kept on the back of the car and the gases, gas canisters in the you know rear seats or rear side of the car. And that monitors your emissions as you drive along. It can be city traffic, it can be hilly areas, it can be the highway. What, wherever you drive, wherever you go, the PDS system, the BMS system, monitors your uh, engine out emissions, or rather your uh, exhaust pipe out emissions. And then all the data is accumulated. And then once you analyze the data, it'll tell you whether the car passes the test or fails the test, which means the data is similar to what they found in WLTP cycle when it's being tested in the laboratory or it's higher or lower. So this is all about emissions from say a regular fuel, petrol or diesel perspective. Right. One very good thing which happened is that people are more aware about safety for a car. Nobody, you know, most of the people don't ask kitna deti hai or how much is the mileage of my car. They also ask, you know, how safe is my car? Because they, everybody is on social media nowadays and Global NCAP has done a great job by testing 50 car models which are sold in the Indian market. You know, it's a great uh, deal because most of them, they test by their own. Very few percentage of the cars are sponsored. So when you come to know about the safety of the car and the safety of your car relative to something else which is being sold at a lower price point or a higher price point, you obviously would want to spend your hard earned money on a car which is safer and will protect your family, right? Because every Indian second biggest purchase after a house would be a car. So which is why India has decided to, you know, insource its uh, crash testing and make a proposal for Bharat NCAP, which is like or based on the standards of global NCAP and Euro NCAP, has the same front offset deformable barrier crash tests, side impact tests, active safety tests, and also most importantly, pedestrian safety, which is on the bumper and the hood of the car. But one thing you might ask, there is already a type proposal which is supposed to be passed for a car to be sold in the Indian market. Of course, yes. Even with the type approval, which has a 50, 50 km an hour crash test in the frontal, and there is no side, and there is pedestrian uh, you know, crash, protect, crash test also. But then even with all this and homologation is done, the couple of models still scored zero stars in the global NCAP tests. So we cannot say the type approval is bad. Type approval is the bare minimum. It's really good that we have type approval in the uh, homologation process for the, for the process to, to sell a car. But type approval is the bare minimum. For every car to be safe or to be considered safer, it should say, uh, I wouldn't say four or five stars, but it should have a stable body structure. And the number of airbags don't really count unless you have a stable body structure. You can have, for example, 12 airbags or the entire cabin structure encompassed in airbags, but still you would have a bad safety rating or the passengers will have grave injuries if your structure is body structure, A pillar, B pillar, front quarter panels, front, front bumper is not strong which was the result of the Kia car which was tested a couple of days back by Global NCAP. It was the only six airbag car on sale from the base variant and it scored dismally bad. Like even with type approval, you had the Espresso, you know, scoring zero stars. You know, that was a car which came after the type approval. So it should have had at least a bare amount of safety. But, you know, so it's really good that Bharat NCAP is being, you know, enforced. Uh, hopefully it becomes a reality in uh, you know from the draft stage to the reality stage in a couple of years or sooner yeah six airbags limit you know is a way to force manufacturers to build stronger cars or uh, you know or say the bodies stronger bodies of the cars 
because obviously you need space to have six airbags which is why most of the models were dropped from their lineups because Alto 800 Tour is a taxi variant which has only a driver airbag but from October 1st it should have a you know a dual front airbag setup but obviously everybody has seen an Alto 800 or the old generation Altos there is physically no space to fit in six airbags right and only because there was absolute necessity they agreed to the ABS and the regular single driver airbags option so you would see most of these models like this uh, the Datsun Redigo or the Espresso or the Alto 800 models will drop off and newer newer generation models will come in which had the design intent of the mandatory six airbags uh, rule right we can't just be happy with say passive safety okay fine my car's got ABS my car's got airbags I can drive at 100 mile an hour no even though you have you know the best brakes in the world or the best airbag or the best structure you still have unexpected circumstances where the car's computer will do a better job of you know controlling the car than the driver because in the chaos situation or panic situation you will not know your left leg from your right leg and you might just flow the accelerator and hit a tree by trying to avoid something so this is where ADAS comes into the, into the picture which is advanced driver assistance systems I am not sure what the first car was but the first mainstream car which wasn't a Merc, Audi or a Volkswagen I mean sorry a BMW I feel was the uh, MG Gloucester which made ADAS features which came into the mainstream market and also the XUV 700 followed suit as well so those features are really difficult to tune to Indian roads like adaptive cruise control and say ESP traction control with the various modes which the car senses based on you know uh, various sensors it has in the car whether it's rainy muddy snowy and then uh, overcomes all this with the Indian traffic scenario where you have two wheelers, cycles, uh, trucks flying past an 80 kmph and a cow crossing in the middle and people jumping across the divider and crossing to overcome all this and finally use its programming you know avoid an obstacle turn turn the car adjust the stability get stable keep going you know and thereby protecting the passengers it's really very difficult and really commendable that at least a couple of manufacturers are introducing ADAS into India so this slide you would have seen almost everywhere now it was the future a couple of years ago it is the present it is there in every single car at least some level of these technologies is there in every single car Connected obviously connect uh, you know you have vehicle to home or vehicle to vehicle is the only thing which is not there now You still have vehicle to home you have vehicle to uh, You have your concierge services which is there on the uh, Hyundai's the Kia's with the SOS buttons and stuff you also have it with few Mahindra's and uh, Few MG's as well autonomous driving you have adaptive cruise control is the far farthest we've got from it and also the lane the lane watch the lane keeping and the lane departure of the 700 and also most of the ADAS features of the cluster but that's where the buck stops we've not actually come into full self-driving like you know a Tesla or you know some other autonomous Waymo taxi or the uh, other taxis in China which have been authorized and mandated uh, to be used on public roads shared of course has taken a big hit thanks to COVID but then there are people like electric vehicle uh, minivan makers called Kano who've designed their products on this idea of a shared mobility concept and also the electric mobility concept now obviously Tesla is no longer the only thing you associate with electric vehicles because almost every manufacturer maybe it's not a you know true blue electric product but some rendition of their prior products is an electric vehicle 
like you have a Hyundai's Kona, you have a Hyundai Kona ICE also, EV version is the Hyundai Kona EV, MG ZS EV, Tata Nexon EV and also Kia's EV6. Apart from that you have companies who just make electric cars like uh, Rivian, uh, also Lucid, Lucid Air. And you also have the mainstream manufacturers like Mercedes who've you know, got their EQA, EQB, EQS and also a nice concept which is coming in the couple, next couple of slides which has achieved a remarkable feat with the almost similar 90% tech of uh, the production model. But then some sort of electrification is there in all models. Like electrification need not be only fully electric, it can be hybrid. Like most of the products are becoming hybrid nowadays. A press release today by Marty Suzuki said they're going to focus on hybrid models rather than going fully electric. And their first hybrid, fully blown hybrid product which, will be, uh, which is going to be rolled out is the one in partnership with Toyota which is the High Rider or the new Vitara which, which should be unveiled in a couple of days on the 1st of July. Yeah, as I said, this is being done to show that they do care, they're doing something about uh, you know electrification from that standpoint but also to meet their cafe tour targets you also have huge trucks who are trying to go the electric route you have obviously the cyber truck from Tesla a few Nikola models uh, and there are also few companies who invest and for, uh, do R&D on huge battery packs like CATL who wants to you know uh, develop battery packs for long range commercial vehicles there's also a nice little news on the commercial vehicle charging aspect which would which we'll see now right so when I say upcoming trends or future trends I don't mean in the distant future 10 15 years from now this is coming in a couple of years whether we like it or not and most of them depend on electrification but it's not all you know bad news for the days of the IC engine there are people like we'll come to the next slide where there are you know huge manufacturers of uh, monopolies of say uh, petrol or diesel engines who are trying to give one last hurrah for the IC engine so let's just check this out first so you can see a three-wheeler in the first image that would seem like any other three-wheeler to you but if I could zoom just yeah, if I could zoom most of you could see powered by Audi so you you would think Audi is mad to you know leave cars and then come to two or three wheelers it's not the case you would have seen Audi e-trons, e-tron GTs and most of their electric vehicle lineup. All of them use lithium ion batteries. What happens to them when they have to be recycled in say five or six years? They, one, they either have to be recycled into something else like an energy storage system for uh, say some other application but they, they can't be used in the same car because it won't have that much you know energy storage capabilities so what they and another battery recycling startup called Nunam have done is they've made a three wheeler out of the uh, recycled test vehicles batteries you know the Audi e-tron and e-tron GTs after their test cycle the batteries have to be discarded so those batteries are procured by Nunam the, that is the end of life batteries are procured by Nunam. They are recycled. They all the checks are done, and then whatever cells are in good condition, that battery pack is made into the power source of this three wheeler. And this is the second life for those Audi EV batteries. And these Nunam Audi three wheelers are going to be sold in India for uh, you know women entrepreneurs you know who get their or small business owners who can get their uh, goods delivered on time and which is really interesting because 
you might think of the automotive industry being a really wasteful industry who does little to no recycling but then this is a good step in the right direction with the electric vehicle batteries right. coming to the next one so cars are not just about designing at one point of time they've got to sell so what covid has taught us is that you don't really need a physical showroom you just need your car somewhere you need your uh, a person standing there with a camera mobile with a video uh, capability and a calling capability to a prospective buyer so you can either ask the buyer to call the person sales executive and he or she can show around the car or you invest in a VR uh, setup wherein you can see every single variant of the car every single accessory you can put on it every single powertrain option drivetrain option and also how it's sold in different countries and the entire gambit of selling and buying can be virtual so i'm not saying that there is no need for dealerships anymore obviously you need dealerships to you know to be a point of contact uh, with the oem and the customer because they cover a wide area, they know their customer base and obviously you need somebody to service your cars. Like Even though it can be an EV and they can say, oh, our cars need not be serviced in their entire lifetime. But that's not the case. You do have service brakes, you do have coolants, they are going to drip, somebody is going to crash somewhere, somebody has to, you know, be on the far end of fixing it. So you do need dealerships. But the buying experience need not be handled by the dealerships. They don't make much money on buying a, on selling a car also. There is not much of a dealer markup. But then if you think about stuff like a Ford GT or a Chevy Camaro ZL1, these cars have a huge dealer markup. So maybe only these cars you could have, say, buying through a dealer, or the process can be streamlined. But then the way the customer looks at the car can be one of the ways through virtual reality. Now this third photo I've you know I've marked it as a hostile takeover because that's the first thing which came to my mind when Apple said their Apple CarPlay is gonna take over all the screens in your car. Like nowadays cars have too many screens, there are no physical buttons, you know, which you would like to you know feel and touch the foot and you know have a nice tactile feel to the buttons say the ac controls the ac knob or stuff like that but now most of them have only screens so you have one screen for your infotainment one screen for as a virtual cockpit and you in certain cars like the jeep grand wagon here there is also an infotainment screen for the front co-passenger and obviously you have screens in the headdress for the rear passengers so Apple claims that once you connect your iPhone to your car, all the screens would be that much Apple-fied. So you, could, you, have, you can have a thousand combination of speedometer or tachometers, uh, fuel gauges, uh, apps integrated into the system, you know, endless movies you could watch. But then one thing would be, I would hate it if I have to pay a subscription fee to see how much fuel is left in my car. <laughs> That's the first thing which came into my mind when I thought, you know, Apple is going to take over your car and everything is going to be that much worse. You know, all jokes aside, that is a really nice way to integrate everything with your phone and, uh, you know, not have that much issues with, you know, seeing whether you have the right track on the car, whether this cable is okay, whether the car can take up, the speakers can take up this or uh, whether the infotainment would play on my, you know, new device or screen. Coming to the next one, as I said, there are commercial vehicles which have huge batteries and it's really very difficult to, uh, for them to charge. It will take hours and hours on end. I mean, even if you have a truck with the Department of Transport authorized uh, 15 minute or 20 minute checkpoints for say 100 points checkpoints on your truck, if you have to check that, that will take you the maximum or the best part of half an hour. But huge batteries take so long to charge even though you are at a fast charging station. So let's say it takes you an hour. But then what these people, what the people at uh, 
uh, Charin Global have decided is that they're gonna go one step further and roll out megawatt charging not kilowatt megawatt charging for EVs so huge amounts of power being put into the batteries to charge immediately and this would really help the commercial vehicle sector because they have huge batteries on their trucks even though they have regenerative braking to uh, and huge mass and that momentum can really charge up the batteries with regenerative braking but still when you are run out of say hills to go down you will ultimately find you know planes and flat surfaces wherein you would need juice from the battery pack to keep going so in those places when you eventually find the charging station the, the folks over at Charin Systems have introduced megawatt charging systems to dominate the electric heavy duty trucks and buses they and it's not just limited to say trucks or buses you can also do it for you know electric ships or electric planes like for example what Rolls Royce is doing yeah this one I would not say is an upcoming trend but it's a present trend you know most of you will have seen the Hyundai Venue uh, I would have I would say that that was one of the first cars which really you know piqued my interest because that was the first one to be introduced with a turbo gasoline direct injection engine and a 7 speed dual clutch transmission so with that Hyundai really diversified their lineup and they had multiple engine options a regular MPFI petrol a turbo GDI petrol and a diesel and they also had DCTs CVTs regular torque converter gearboxes and obviously a manual and now they also have something called a clutchless manual so on that technological forefront of innovation they also have brought in connected car tech which is home to car connectivity so you have personal assistants like google home assistant google nest and also alexa so why don't you try out that feature by connecting your car up to a personal assistant who you don't know where the data is going to who you don't know where it's, or your data is being monitored who else is being connected onto the same network why don't you even give it control of your car and say Alexa or Google hey Google start up my venue so Hyundai has given you the ability to give your personal vehicle data to Alexa or Google and then also tells you when you start your car how many miles you travel and you know where your home location is I'm kidding obviously because you know they have security protocols in place but then why on earth would you connect your Alexa to your car but then that's what people want based on so many customer surveys people want connected car tech they want their phones connected to their cars and their cars connected to their phones and everything in between even to switch off a light or switch on a fan they would you know they would prefer it if some digital bot does it for them so lo and behold you have Hyundai's venue with the home to car connectivity where you say hey Alexa start my car and it will start your venue so coming to the last picture in the slide I've you know sarcastically mentioned just another mode of transport because for me a car is another member of my family it's not just a thing which I you know go to travel to work and back home in but then the folks over at Cruise have decided that car is just another mode of transportation like a bus or a coach and they've made it autonomous they don't want people like me who like driving driving a car and they just want to make it a shared mobility platform or say mobility as a service of types so again this one is you know uh, slated for launch in San Francisco as a pilot project but still it is an autonomous taxi with a driver in the in the driver's seat a human being in the driver's seat for safety purposes they don't want to say a repeat of uh, the issues with Waymo or say Google or Apple so that's about it for you know saying how the automotive industry will progress it's basically on CASE but then this is something which really intrigues me and I'm really grateful about because this is what made me become an automobile engineer in the first place so the let's go one by one the first one 
Mercedes Vision EQXX. So that car is basically a thousand kilometer EV, uh, 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 an EV with a range of a thousand kilometers. So how does it manage to pull out such a feat? It's got the same backbone of the uh, EQS uh, AMG electric vehicle, but still it manages to pull off a thousand kilometer range because it is lighter and the batteries are packaged into a 70% smaller case than what it is in the EQS. And also the streamlining is so much that it all, all it beats its own siblings uh, dry coefficient rating which was the CLA in uh, a couple of years back. So that Mercedes have said that it is not uh, a car for sale. It is merely a test platform, but it still has the backbone of the uh, EQS Coupe or rather the EQS um, sedan. But then it portrays what Mercedes is capable of. They are capable, I mean, they, are, they say their cars are capable of beating the range anxiety, which is the number one reason for people who own EVs and who are prospective buyers of EVs to not purchase an EV. Because imagine you drive all the way from your hometown to say a resort somewhere and you end up having to charge the car there for you to keep on going to say a, a picnic location nearby or charge the car two times while you are coming to your house. That is really very difficult because it takes barely 10 minutes if you find a good petrol station. And now petrol stations are there at I think every uh, 15 kilometers or so on the highway. And you have a range of petrols as well, speed, regular, extra premium, high octane, shell, shell vipa, you, you, you know, you name it, they have it. But then charging stations are few and far between. Like there is no guarantee that even if you find a charging station, it's going to be working and it's going to have the ultra super fast charging like a supercharger or what the megawatt charging system I know showcased earlier was like. So when you give the customer the freedom of going any way they want with the uh, assurance that the car is going to do the thousand kilometers as promised and I don't mean they've achieved the feat as in with no AC going at 30 kmph they traveled from Stuttgart to Silverstone in the UK, you know, from Germany to UK. And for f for 14 hours of those, uh, I think it was 20 hour journey, the AC was on. And they did, or they flew on the Autobahn uh, at uh, 100 kmph speeds, 120 kmph speeds. And also they were in heavy packed city centers and they had a lot of weather to deal with as well. So in real world conditions, they've achieved almost 1000 kilometers range. So if that doesn't beat range anxiety, I don't know what will. Maybe a, a Mazda solution, which would be a Wankel engine as a range extender. No, but then that's Mazda. So coming to the next one. Formula E is, you know, for me, a, a disruptor to Formula One. But still, it's got really great tech if you take it from a really positive outlook and positive perspective. Uh, Formula E's Gen 3 car is the fastest Formula E car yet with a top speed of uh, over 300 kmph. And most of its uh, speed comes down to the aero and also it's got a very nifty little powertrain setup which is most efficient for an EV. The power efficiency of this is around 95 percentage with the with one electric motor delivering up to 470 brake horsepower, which is close to what a Mustang's V8 makes. But then if you take say a regular petrol engine, the thermal efficiency or the overall efficiency would be around 40 percent. This is around 95 percent. Obviously, because there are fewer moving parts and it's an electric motor. But then the first ever you know feat for this is that there are two motors one in the front one in the back and get this the best part about this or i would say the most you know when you think at it in the beginning is the most stupid part but there are no brakes 
there are no rear brakes. The only braking it relies on is from the discs at the front and the regenerative system of the front part train and the rear part train. Since it's got a two part train setup or two motor setup, it can generate so much braking force via the regenerative brakes that it can completely out forgo uh, rear brakes which would save in weight but I don't think when it comes to a reality the regulations will allow so you might have say uh, this is by the Formula E but you do have players like Jaguar, Mahindra, uh, Neo who will obviously take tech stuff from their Formula E cars into their road going cars so they might have they might still have brakes obviously and also this features ultra high speed charging capabilities of around 600 kilowatts now that's just a bit of uh, you know information to pacify me saying that is almost as good as formula 1 which i don't want to but it is almost as good as formula 1 if not closer to formula formula 1 on the you know tech front but then nothing beats getting Formula 1 tech uh, onto a road car, which is what Mercedes have strived to achieve for so many years and they've finally done it with their Mercedes AMG Project 1, which is now the Mercedes AMG 1. So this is one of the most outrageous cars I've ever seen because it's got the same engine setup or the same powertrain setup from the Mercedes uh, 7 title winning Formula 1 car. Uh, which is a 1.6 liter V6 if I am not wrong or a 1.4 liter I am not very sure and it's got four electric four electric motors one on each wheel and it's an all wheel drive setup so but all these things result in around say upwards of 1000 horsepower and a 217 mile an hour top speed which is say around 350-375 uh, kmph. So that is good stuff from Merck and it all it has all the fancy brake vectoring, torque vectoring, uh, active aero above the uh, uh, tires which help in aerodynamics and the airflow with uh, they prevent porpoising obviously which is a real which is a real headache for most of the teams in Formula 1 now and uh, it's close to what you would get to a formula one car and obviously everything is sold out and if it was sold out long before they had finished testing but then that's the closest thing you would get to a formula one car and obviously it is the poster it's become the poster uh, which you will find on every boy or girl's bedroom for you know years to come you might have a chiron but this nothing beats you know formula one tech most of you might know the goodwood festival of speed where a lot of manufacturers bring in their one-offs or uh, you know pre-production vehicles to set up a hill climb challenge record so one among them is ford and they've brought their super van 4 so you might think what exactly is a super van so the very first super van was basically a Ford Transit, which is a Ford Courier mail van, with which was placed on the chassis of a Ford GT40. So this monstrosity has become the uh, brainchild of uh, future super vans, and this latest rendition is a 2,000 horsepower, uh, you know, EV which is poised to set the uh, record at Goodwood Festival of Speed. We know, we, we'll know when uh, the results are out. But this is basically the latest advancement of Ford Pros, which is Ford Productivity's, uh, their commercial arms, uh, e-transit, which is going to be the face of all the electric vans sold in Europe, around 14 models. And it is the Ford E-Transit, which is the Model E Division's Transit Electric Transit Van, combined with Ford Performance's way of saying, we have an all-wheel drive 2000 horsepower EV, which is fun and which is, you know, versatile to do whatever application. Coming to what powers these things, the drivetrain and the powertrain, 
you will all know that you know magnets rare earth elements like neodymium magnets are required for the functioning of a motor say a BLDC or PMSM or induction motor but what the folks of Mali have done have they've developed a you know an EV motor which does not rely on magnets or rare earth elements and they've managed to crank out 96 percent motor efficiency from this motor so you might ask without magnets what do they actually use so they say that the traction motor does not require any magnets because it generates the necessary magnetic field by means of an excitation coil so that coil gives them the necessary magnetic field and that helps in the motor rotation and not just that it's, it, it just doesn't say <coughs> okay it works it's become you know 95 percent efficient which is one of the best motors out there so when this comes into production it will be sustainable and it will be a revolutionary product coming to the last topic for discussion you know the people at Cummins have really again uh, you know have gotten my respect because they've introduced a 15 liter hydrogen engine at their ACT Expo in uh, Los Angeles, America. So what this basically is, is an IC engine, which is on a fuel agnostic platform. So what does that mean, fuel agnostic? You can put whatever you want, natural gas, LPG, uh, hydrogen, diesel, and the cylinder block would remain the same. But the cylinder head, the valves, the uh, intake, exhaust manifolds would change for hydrogen, uh, bi biogas, natural gas applications. So this just goes to prove that the engine is not the problem for combating greenhouse gas emissions. It is the fuel. So yeah, we might run out of petrol or diesel, but we have a lot of people working on internal combustion engines but with sustainable fuels like Cummins who have introduced a 15 litre and a 6.7 litre uh, hydrogen fueled engine at a recent expo. So they feel that this engine which would give out say 800 or say 1000 uh, newton meters of torque and around 300 to 350 horsepower is you know commercially viable which is why they have given a target of set a target of 2027 for mass production of their hydrogen engines. So this is about it which I wanted to share with you all. There's a few things which I uh, got data on recently and was you know really interested by them. Hope you are interested by them too and if you have any questions please do let me know. I am always available on LinkedIn. I am active on LinkedIn. Please connect, feel free to connect with me. Yeah, and if you require any sort of career advice, please let me know. Thanks, thanks everybody for your time. Thanks, Sharvel, for the invitation. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, sir. It was it was really a, a eye opening and a very informative session for all of us. Uh, there are a few questions in the chat box as I can see, and we all do have quite a bit of questions that we can see. If you have any questions, you can unmute your mics and speaker, or you can put your questions in the chat box. Um, sir, I have a question. Yes, um, we have seen Maruti. We have seen Maruti, but we on petrol CNG versions with the recent launch of the Brezza and Ertiga and the. Right. Yes. Yes. Sir, will, make up, will they ever, uh, ever be able to make up for the loss in the market share with the go going away of the 1.3 Fiat source and the 1.5 diesel? Like the per kilometer cost is almost the same, but uh, will they ever be able to uh, get back the market share? Like if you check the market share when the MJDs were there, it was around 55 to 57%. Now they've come up to 50%. They've not, they're not saying that we are going away, doing away with diesel technology. They're just saying that diesel technology is difficult for, uh, for, you know, to be profitable for Marathi. I mean, it'd be, we yes. all love, you know, MJDs and cars. The MJDs really uh, helped Marathi get their market share but then now they yes. have focused on you know 1.5 petrols and their dual jet motors and their global lineup you've seen the balino rs with the booster jet 
that had jet all wheel, yeah, that had all wheel disc brakes and a booster jet engine, which was only available in Europe at the time. So that came to India as yeah. you know a homologated version, and like the booster jet, GDI dual dual injectors per cylinder is becoming the norm for uh, Maruti's as of late. So you would get the same power, you would get obviously you will not get say a 250 Nm torque, but you would get close to the acceleration of uh, the MJDs, and also they've introduced Suzuki Super Carry. Which is a commercial pickup. Um, yes, sir. Pickup, pickup can't truck. say, but um, say a half ton, half ton van. truck. Yeah, half ton truck. So that success was so huge that they are diversifying into so many uh, states of India, and they are also planning to introduce CNG versions of that too. Like it's good that you brought up CNG because that is uh, coming close to. Uh, what do you say? Close to the efficiency of the diesels. And people accept that is the biggest, you know, plus point. People accept that the CNG versions are good because most of their uh, sources are from the uh, metropolitan cities like Delhi, where in CNG was a big thing, even when the BS3 and BS4 was there, thanks to the pollution. So people accept there are success stories and they accept that CNG is a viable alternative. So I feel okay, just sir. because people have got uh, used to their tech features that they will be overshadowed by what actually passed the car. What actually passed the car would be some sort of a petrol engine from Suzuki's global lineup. Obviously, we're not going to get their diesels anymore. It was a dismal failure when Marty made their two-cylinder Celerios by themselves and made two Celerio engines together and made a 1.5 for the Sierra's and Ertica for a couple of months till the BS6 kicked in. So we're not going to have diesels anymore, but then we're going to have cars tech laden and hybrids, which will overshadow the fact that it is not a diesel. Yeah, but we'll definitely miss the torque of the DDIS 225 and the 240. Yes, correct. First yeah, that's really sad. So we'll just have to stick to what Toyota gives to Maruti, albeit if it's a <laughs> diesel. Thank you, sir. Okay, I've got a question. Views on micro mobility in the EV segment, right? As I said, we make bicycles. We also have e-assisted bicycles. Who, uh, or rather, the e-assisted bicycles give you that torque addition and the uh, what do you call it? the support in climbing hills and gradients. If you're talking about micro mobility from, say, a quadricycle point of view like the Bajaj Cute or the Renault Ami, which has come in certain certain cities of the world, not certain markets, but certain cities of the world. I feel the Bajaj Cute itself had its fair share of troubles trying to get homologated in India. It had to wait for a long period of time till the Indian government realized that there is a segment called quadricycles. And just recently, they've got the petrol version. So getting an electric version would be really difficult at least in India, because, the, I mean, it's, it, I'm not saying that there aren't people working on it. You'll have Mahindra of their Atom EV who are working on it, uh, on, you know, micro mobility. But it shouldn't be another failure case like the Nano. The Nano was a really good idea, which failed due to bad marketing. And the unaccept unacceptance of, you know, the consumers saying that it is the cheapest car in the world. I don't want to be known as some person who has the cheapest car. I, want, I would want to be known as a person who's got, say, a technologically advanced car. So that's the thing. So micro mobility might not say, might not get a green light in India, but you would feel you would have smaller cars and bicycles getting the electrification treatment. Sir, I think by micro mobility, he's trying to point out towards the electric scooties and the new startups that we have in India. Uh, oh, I personally okay, had a question about like uh, the Ola scooties and the Aether scooties catching fire. And like, uh, is it a wise decision decision to buy, uh, like spend upwards of one lakh rupees on such EVs or we should go for like cheaper alternatives? We have like local brands who are producing 
uh, EVs are supposed uh, sourcing the uh, EV powertrain from China and stuff like that. Got it. Yeah. So when you have an electric vehicle purchase in mind, if you want to go for a scooter, what are your options? You have Ather, who claim to have or uh, done all their R and D in India. Who you have Bajaj Chetak. The motors done by Bosch. The batteries, I'm really not sure where it's done by. None of the sources I had were, you know, authentic. You have Ola. You have, you know, the issue with Ola. The product is okay, but for the Indian market, it's been done really badly. You have uh, Simple Energy, who have their scooters, which looks amazing on paper, but I don't think they've started deliveries yet. And you have people like. Uh, SVM, uh, bounce, and uh, not bounce. Bounce is a model, but you have certain other. Um, not getting the names as of now, but you have really it's say. Yes. Sorry. You have the Ather four fifty X as well. Yeah, you have the Ather four fifty X as well. That is a mainstream brand. That's correct. But you have, like uh, Sharmil said, all these local brands like uh, SVM, which is basically a clone of something you get in China, right? Yeah, exactly. So like Iyashwa and other brands exactly. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Iyashwa. Okinawa also, I am not very sure because nah. they claim to have a huge manufacturing setup. They've invested so much in the manufacturing setup as well. But then we really don't know because their I praise actually looks like a clone of something which is made in China. And there have been articles about it by so many uh, you know, famed brands like Autocar Magazine and uh, uh, Top Gear. So I feel it would be, if at all you want to purchase an EV, you feel your EV, your, your house is getting surplus electricity, which you would want to spend on an electric scooter, keep worrying about the range wherever you go. And, uh, you know, if you have, first of all, if you have upwards of one lakh to uh, buy on EV, or if you want to finance it through a financier, see whether they are okay with buying uh, an electric two-wheeler. I mean, you can go for it. But then you would have the issues with charging, range anxiety. You would, we would not know where, when it will blow up. That is the fact. Because you have so it's many like batteries. Buying a time bomb. Just exactly. waiting for it. Exactly, yeah. As you know, very well put. Because thermal runaway is a really bad thing. It's a really scary thing also. Recently, a Tesla Model S played, caught on fire, and it took around 40,000 liters of water from the San Francisco Fire Department to put it out. And lastly, even after doing this, it, it didn't, the fire wasn't doused. So they dug a pit, filled it with water, push the car into the pit of water and that's when the thermal runaway stopped and the fire you know subsided so the electric vehicle market is still in the infancy stage you will have issues like this you will have issues like your display is getting cracked your uh, car your the worst part was the Ola going in the reverse direction at 80 kmph and also you will not know when the fires will happen of course, you cannot say that similar issues will not happen in say an Activa or a Shine. But obviously your battery is not going to blow up in your Activa. Your fuel tank might if you have a bad accident. But if you drive safely and you know you obey the rules of the road, I feel it's still safer to buy a, an IC engine rather than an EV at this point of time. And people don't mind financing an EV, I mean, an uh, IC engine, even if it is 70, 75K. A Honda Dio, which I bought in, which my mom bought for me in 2013, was around 45 grand. Now the Honda Dio is around 80 grand. So BS6 has cost so much, so many uh, issues to the price. You, have, you need to have so much equipment and your price actually skyrockets. But then since Two-wheelers, IC engine two-wheelers, cars, trucks have been there for a long amount of time. There are policies in place which will give you, you know, a tax rebate on certain cars, which will give you uh, certain two-wheelers also. And you have the benefit of financiers being able to finance the vehicle. You need not say shell out one lakh in the beginning and uh, see how, how I'm going to eat in the next month. 
you can you know make equated monthly installments with the financier it, it doesn't mind if you cross 1.2 1.3 lakhs also because one your vehicle is going to last for a long time you are not going to be stuck somewhere in the middle of nowhere and you're not going to blow up so i would advise you to stay away from evs till it becomes you know a proper product till more people come in or more accidents happen and the government finally decides to put in a probe to see why these issues are occurring and they go for you know made in india manufacturing only so until this technology matures please stay away from an ev at least the two wheeler point of at least the two wheeler side of things cars yes they are much more safer because you have a lot more things to deal with but still i would prefer if at all i'm buying my next car it would be a lease and it would be an ic engine maybe a hybrid that's the maximum electric vehicle i'm not going to invest in india in the say uh, next 5 to 10 years but then if somebody comes up with a bang bang good product like uh, you know with uh, range equal to a petrol and re- charging time equal to say filling a f- fuel tank then and the price obviously the price on par with the petrol with no issues of battery is getting exported then we might think differently but now ICEs are a safer option yeah sure sure that that makes a lot of sense uh, apart from you know uh, charging the batteries more like efficiently uh, the faster we charge them the more they deteriorate and the faster exactly. they deteriorate so exactly. that's one correct. issue that we have to cover up before correct so suppose yeah, you, go, are, you keep doing long distances uh, you would need fast charging you can't be stuck say you have a 12 hour journey ahead of you you can't be stuck for another 12 hours just charging your battery so at that point of time you will have to find a fast charger with 30 minute charging and that will obviously deteriorate your battery but it'll get you to your destination half an hour late but still within that 12 hour gap so that is another issue mm-hmm. that doesn't and happen then- in a fuel tank you, your fuel tank doesn't deteriorate every time you fill in fuel maybe <laughs> after 15 20 years of owning the car but not say the second day of ownership exactly and you can actually uh, recycle the product uh, once you buy an ev the batteries are like the essential part of the chassis if you discard the if you got your batteries go wrong then you have to discard the whole product exactly i mean you're just now coming across people with end of life batteries uh, you know technologies like nuna am and audi yeah yes yeah, so there are a few more questions we can answer in the sure sure Will self-driving cars ever work on the streets of India? <laughs> okay, so I was waiting. I was waiting for this question. Uh, full self-driving cars—it's a real long shot. But you have companies which have tested ADAS technologies, active safety uh, with ESP, different ranges in ESP. You can see on the roads, uh, lane departure warning, um, lane keep assist, even on the curves, not only on the straights. The XUV 700 does. autonomous emergency braking aeb the mg gloster does that most volvos do that most of the systems in mercs are disabled for india but still they do have a radar in the front which detects which is used for uh, you know active cruise control or adaptive cruise control that is still a feature in india but full self driving uh, i would not say is a long shot but it will come maybe when the infrastructure develops when the infrastructure develops is a big question but uh, you know it's better to be prepared and do the r and d in the beginning itself rather than you know require it and not have it and then uh, have it and not require it which is why most of the oems have already started work on hydrogen long back you know since the fuel is the issue it is not the ic engine it is the fuel so the same way please do research on self driving cars focus yourselves in that area of say machine learning artificial intelligence It's a really good area to focus on especially for major projects and mini projects but then fully putting it on to a car in india will take time fsd will take time adas is easier to do 
easier to do relatively it's, it's not like uh, you know putting in buying a controller from somewhere putting doing the code and expecting the car to work it's not like that but relatively to fsd it is relatively easier what are your views on tesla in india secondly are evs really green okay so we've made petrol engine diesel engine ic engine cars for a long time we've never once bothered about what the exhaust fumes are doing to the environment but now since we are on the verge of you know blowing up the earth because of the greenhouse gases we say okay it's time to go back to the drawing board and see what doesn't pollute uh, you know on the face of it so on the face of it if you charge evs with uh, electricity from wind power or say geothermal energy biomass renewable sources of energy yes it is green but obviously the batteries aren't you have to you have a huge chunk of the car as uh, sharbel said 50 percentage of the car which is the battery has to be thrown out in four to five years even though manufacturers say warranty of seven eight years it it really doesn't uh, happen that way in real time so when you have to recycle batteries it is a pain unless you have secondary storage systems for the end of life batteries like uh, uh, for a few applications not only for mobility but standalone you know uh, super capacitors or stuff like that which would help you uh, power your house in that in, in the event of a blackout and which will help the grid get more energy as well so in those cases it's okay but then is it really green because it is uh, completely renewable completely sustainable i would say not so i mean the same argument you can say for ic engines as well are they really green on the face of it no bs6 vehicles uh they are environmentally friendly to the extent of they will not harm anything from the exhaust pipe but there are uh, you know materials in uh, ic engines which you cannot recycle like for example you can melt down an engine block and use it for something else i mean if it is cast iron say for the ship of a, the hull of a ship or something like that or you can break down the hull of a ship and uh, use it as with that scrap you can refine and use it as an engine block for your you know cast iron car so but then when you think of a mobility solution which is completely renewable it is not ic engine it is not electric vehicle it is not hydrogen fuel cell as well so nobody has you know uh, come come across a completely renewable car if they have had they're either silenced by the government <laughs> no, i'm kidding or uh, Uh, it's, it's just not been found yet so evs on the face of it are not really green even if they are uh, sourced by i mean powered by renewable energy they are better than ic engines obviously but then where else where do we get power you know produced by uh, ic engines i mean power produced by renewable sources of energy just a few weeks back most of the uh, trains were cut because we had a coal shortage so even in 2022 we have coal shortages and we require coal to produce our electricity in the thermal power plants so when this is the case and when there is an overload in the grid so with the deficit you want a smaller portion of that deficit to be put into your cars and you know bikes and trucks to you know, transport goods or you know transport the nation as a mobility solution that is simply not the case it might work for any uh, countries which produce their electricity from renewable sources in europe definitely it, it will work norway's electric vehicle uh, production is huge and on china in china the tesla is accounted for 40 percentage of cars sold i'm not saying 40 percentage of evs 40 percentage of all the cars sold hydrogen ic engine petrol diesel uh, cng lpg electric vehicle 40 percentage of all cars sold were electric vehicles and i'm not saying china makes their uh, electricity renewable sources but still 
you there will come a point a uh, time wherein you would have renewable sources of energy to power your electric vehicle and by then everybody might have moved on to say fuel cells or again ic engines with hydrogen uh, as a fuel so we haven't really found ways of you know extracting energy through 100% completely renewable means or mobility solutions which are 100% green it's a it's a long road ahead this is what i wanted to say okay can we consider the bajaj chetak for regular commutes uh, i would say there is literally a no difference between a chetak or an eta or a simple energy an ev is an ev you know you might say the toyota is more reliable than uh, suzuki but yeah that is minor differences and uh, Uh, the chetak might have better manufacturing quality than an eta just because they have the parent giant of bajaj who have been making bikes uh, and scooters for a long time bikes for a long time so that manufacturing prowess they have and the quality of fit and finish might be better but then an ev is an ev the range is not going to be more than 100 kilometers and if you want to have a peaceful you know uh, trip choose an ic engine at least for now Okay, I can't really comment on that since I work in the same company. Uh, maybe we can have a you know discussion uh, you know offline. And also another thing I want to say is that uh, the info which I give out now does not pertain to Ford and it's not endorsed by Ford. You know, you know disclaimer since uh, you know since we are in the company now. Uh, any other questions, please? Thanks, Naveen. Thanks for attending. I mean, the honor is mine because you all called me for a second time, so I might have done, must have done something good the first time. <laughs> so it's always a great session whenever it's you, sir. Oh, thank you, thank you, Shivil. Really, it's great work done by SAE VIT because every time I see you know an Instagram post by you all, it is some you know trivia session or a. you know a lecture mm-hmm. session on something which is required by the automobile engineers and you know any engineer who is in the automobile field of this day and age so really commendable work by the sa vit team most uh, collegiate mm-hmm. clubs have to learn from you all thank you thank you sir it's it's just an honor that you follow us just knowing that is oh, great thank sir. you and it was a great time we can short close if there are no other questions yeah i think that'll be it sir Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Sandeep. Thank you. So Thank really you, sir. So really great. Uh, it's a great time. Uh, you know, I had fun interacting with you all. And after a brief hiatus, I'm back to giving lectures. So you know, thanks, sir, well for the first lecture after my hiatus. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you all again someday. Yeah, maybe at your VIT Velour campus also. Thanks. Take care. Bye bye. And do reach out to me on LinkedIn for any questions. Yeah. Thanks, both. Thank you. Thank you, thank sir. Thank you, Sharvel. Take care. Great session. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Take care. Sir, kindly, kindly add your LinkedIn link on chat box. Yeah, sure, sure. If you want to revisit this session, it will be there on my YouTube channel by the end of the evening. I'll put in the YouTube channel link as well. And if that doesn't work, this should work. Okay, so that was a very great session. Uh, thanks, everybody.